Hello, my name is Simonize and welcome to another Simonize Guide video. Today we're talking about rogue tanking. I've been doing a bit more tanking on my rogue characters this phase of Season of Discovery, and in this video I'll share my talents, gearing, and gameplay tips so you can rogue tank your Gnomorgon raids with ease just like me. And if you're like me, tanking is not what you normally do in World of Warcraft, so I want to cover some basic ideas first. As a tank, you have some important responsibilities for your group. First and foremost, you need to hold threat on all the bosses so they focus attacks on you and not other raid members. If you're not holding threat, you're not tanking. With that threat, you are in control of the positioning of the bosses, so you need to make sure they're positioned and moved properly. Finally, it's good to reduce incoming damage taken as well as deal as much damage as you can. These last two often come as a trade-off between dealing more damage or taking less damage, and some situations merit more defense and mitigation, and others are more suited for more damage and offense. We'll talk more about this balance later, let's look at some tank gameplay right away and see what we're actually doing. This is the first boss of Gnomorgon, Grubbis. He's a little bit tricky one since he comes along with his basilisk pet, Chomper. I know my team will be focusing on Grubbis, so I have to focus my threat generation on Grubbis in the first few seconds. Double Mutilate is a lot of damage and a lot of threat, and I pop a Slice and Dice because I already had my Blade Dance active from the Trash Wave prior. A few attacks against Chomper is enough to gain a decent amount of threat, and then I see Grubbis is no longer attacking me, so a quick swap back and I'll use Tease, which is Rogue's taunt ability, to get Grubbis to start attacking me again. From here on, I focus on Grubbis, and I've got a solid threat lead on both enemies. I'm only worried about Chomper casting Petrify, which is taken care of with a quick target swap and kick. The entire time I'm tanking these, I want to move as little as possible. Don't move if it's not required. This helps the rest of your team maintain maximum DPS and healing throughput since they don't have to worry about the boss moving unexpectedly. So priority one is to slam enough Mutilates into my target to make sure I have a good threat lead. Then make sure I have defensive abilities active like Blade Dance. Then, to activate offensive finishing moves like Slice and Dice and Rupture if I have more combo points to spend. If you need greater threat generation, Thistle Tea is likely going to solve all your problems. If you know the people in your group are going to make your life difficult by generating a lot of threat, I'm looking at you Enhancement Shamans. Popping a Thistle Tea on the opener will let you do a lot more Mutilates right away and maintain the threat lead, which is the most important thing for a tank. Evasion can be used proactively for less damage taken or saved for a situation where you notice your health is dipping low. On really short boss fights like the first two, it's probably best to just send it right away. And on longer or scarier fights, you might want to save it in case you notice your healers are struggling. In this run, I'm using a 11 points in assassination, 20 points in combat, talent specialization with relentless strikes and assassination, and dual wield specialization in combat with no repost talent. For the runes, we've got just a flesh wound, mutilate, shuriken toss, blade dance, and rolling with the punches on the boots. I think this is a very good general purpose tanking setup and is what I would recommend if you're trying tanking for the first time. This build has higher sustained damage output and threat generation compared to a full 31 point combat build with blade flurry and adrenaline rush. However, the full combat build has higher initial burst damage and threat. I think either build would be fine, and certainly having Blade Flurry would make holding threat on a second target super easy. If you want to try full combat tanking, absolutely go for it. Some rogue tank players will opt for Envenom on the Leg Rune instead of Blade Dance. This sacrifices a considerable amount of damage mitigation for a considerable amount of damage output. You'll take more damage and also deal more damage with the Envenom Rune. If you're confident in the ability of your healers, it could be a good idea to make this trade. If you're uncertain of how much your healers can handle, or you're not really trying to push speed or DPS limits, the safe option is to stick with Blade Dance. Another way you can turn the dial of defense versus offense is with gear. Most of your gear will be identical to a rogue's DPS best in slot list, but there are a few good swaps. An item like Mantle of the Cunning Negotiator is an easy pick for a tank since it's a very small DPS loss compared to the DPS bis item Failed Flying Experiment, but the Cunning Negotiator shoulders net you a whopping 11 stamina. A more severe exchange would be to swap out a ring like Mark of Kern or Iron Spine's Eye with strong offensive stats for a purely defensive one like Talvash's Brilliant Gold Ring with 16 stamina. Tanking is not something as clearly optimizable as DPS, it's a bit more nuanced. Exactly how much threat generation is enough will vary group to group and varies depending on what your goals are. 
exactly how much stamina, defense, or mitigation stats are necessary or worth going for will again vary. Stronger healers and faster kill times will allow you to be more offensive with your gearing and rune choices, but those same gear and rune decisions in a weaker group will make you look like a stupid idiot as the healers can't keep you alive and will complain that rogue tanks are bad according to them. The consumables are almost all the same as a regular DPS setup, except you'll have Deadly Poison 2 applied to your offhand. The regular consumables are Elixir of Agility, Elixir of Ogre Strength, Elixir of Fortitude, Rumsy Rum Black Label, Elixir of Coalesced Regret, and any of the plus 12 stamina foods like Spider Sausage, but I wasn't using a food buff in this video, I forgot to get it. Without the Deadly Brew Chest Rune, we don't get free poisons and have to manually apply Deadly Poison. Remember also without Deadly Brew, Deadly Poison will have limited charges, meaning it will need to be reapplied frequently since it runs out of charges. You'll need to be sure to refresh it before a boss so it doesn't run out of charges during the boss. With the basics of rogue tanking out of the way, let's take a quick look at a tank point of view on each of the remaining bosses in Nomergon. We already saw Grubbis, so let's check out Viscous Fallout next. Shortly after engaging the boss, he'll spawn some little adds that need to be killed quickly. These don't need to be tanked, so don't worry about that. I glanced at my threat on the boss and saw that I was comfortably ahead, so I decided to switch target and help out with DPS on the adds. I had a good use of redirect here while target swapping to get plenty of combo points on the add to get a nice slice and dice up. This boss will also occasionally drop a noxious gas cloud at his feet that debuffs anyone standing in it. It's good to move the boss out of these gas clouds so the melee behind the boss are not affected by them, but remember, you don't want to move the boss any more than you have to, so wait until a cloud is dropped, then move, then stop. You can see I forgot to refresh my deadly poison on this boss, so no deadly poison for me. This is a pretty annoying part of rogue tanking you'll need to get used to. Crowd Pummeler is pretty simple from a tank perspective. Only one mob to worry about, so threat should be a non-issue. You can keep the boss almost entirely stationary the entire time. Right after a Gnomergon slam attack, you can move back to your regular position before he starts attacking again. The only thing that requires you to move the boss is if one of the spinning gears comes near you. You definitely want to avoid those because those will knock you all around the room. Electrocutioner is my favorite fight to tank because as a tank, you don't need to care one bit about any of the mechanics or worry about how today's group wants to handle the arc lightning attack. You just stand with your back against a wall and do your thing. Be sure the boss is directly in front of you and your back is directly to the wall. If the boss is off to your side a little bit, he'll push you around whenever he does the knockback ability. If you're lined up nice and straight, the knockback should barely move you at all. Especially on a boss like this where positioning for the rest of the raid is so delicate, you don't want to be unnecessarily moving yourself or the boss. Mechanical Menagerie and the last boss, Mechaneer, are where things start to get a little scary. While it is possible to solo tank Menagerie, most groups will opt to use an off tank for the dragon. As the main tank, you'll handle the chicken and the squirrel. Getting threat on both can be a little tricky at the start. Send mutilates into one, tab to the other, tease, and send a couple mutilates should usually work well to get you set up. The tank holding the dragon should keep it far enough away that when it uses overheat, it does not overheat buff any of the other bosses. The sheep will just wander around the entire time and does not need to be tanked. For most of the fight, you'll tab back and forth between the squirrel and the chicken to generate threat on both of them. It is also good to use Kick whenever the Squirrel casts Widget Volley to prevent the spell cast. Once you get control of both the Chicken and the Squirrel, your main concern is positioning them. There are a few things that will cause you to need to move. If the Sheep gets too close to you, you gotta get away from that. If the Dragon uses a Breath Attack towards you, you also gotta move. And when the Squirrel does Widget Fortress, you gotta move the bosses out of the shield bubble as well. Some groups will prefer a constant slow drag of the bosses around the room, and if that's what your group wants to do, do it, but I'd say the usual rule applies. The less movement, the better. Thermoplug is the last boss of Nomergon, and the first two phases are the scariest ones. I recommend starting the fight with a magic resistance potion. This tip comes from community member Tzigo, who has been doing way more rogue tanking than I have. This will give you a decent resist chance against the magical attacks from Thermoplug, which are his scariest attacks. When he starts casting Furnace Surge, you should move away. I like starting in the middle of the room, then running towards the door. You need to be far enough away that you don't get damaged by the attack, but if you get too far away, he'll spin towards the melee and set them on fire. It will take a little bit of practice to learn the right distance for kiting during Furnace Surge. 
after a furnace surge, I take him right back into the middle of the room. The rest of the boss doesn't really involve too much from a tank point of view. In all phases, there will be bombs being deployed in the room, and your ranged DPS should kill them quickly, and it won't be a problem. If a bomb happens to explode in the middle where you're tanking the boss, be sure to move him away so neither you nor the melee DPS behind the boss are standing in the persistent effect left behind by the bomb. Phase 2 is scary because of his high damage frost punch attack, but you just have to hope your healers can handle it. The magic resistance potion is again useful here, giving you a chance to completely resist the cold punches. Phase 3 involves poison damage and the boss will occasionally spew poison around the room. This is a channeled spell he's casting, but doesn't show in the default cast bar interface. So you'll need a weak aura or add-on if you want to track it, or just look at the super obvious poison graphic and the debuff he puts on everyone in the raid. Anyways, when he does this, you or someone else will need to do a spell interrupt like kick so he doesn't continue channeling this spell. Phase 4 is all the first three phases combined. So it's pretty much just, you know, move like you moved in phase one for Furnace Surge and kick when he does the poison spew attack. And that's it. If you want to check out Tzigo's tanking video, I linked it in the video description. He plays in what I would say is a high performance group and usually runs in Venom leg rune for more offense instead of Blade Dance rune like you saw me using in this video. I also linked a few of my VODs of rogue tanking, both on a geared character and on a fresh level 40 rogue for your viewing pleasure. Overall, I'd say rogue tanking is quite good and much easier than I thought it would be. Let me tell you what though, it is certainly easier to get invited to groups these days when you offer to tank rather than trying to get invited as rogue DPS. Thank you all for watching. Your support really means a lot to me. If you enjoyed this video and want to see more like it, be sure to leave a like on the video and subscribe on the channel. If you want to see daily World of Warcraft content from me, check out my VODs channel, Simon Eyes Show TV, which is linked in the video description. I hope you're having fun in Season of Discovery, and I hope you have a great day.